Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Excel Center in London where we're covering DSCI, one of the world's truly great trade shows. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Harris, Leonardo DRS, and we're covering this event in partnership with Clarion Events uh, that put on this great show along with many other ones around the world. Uh, and we're working with the UK Department of International Trade's Defense and Security Organization to bring you the very best of British defense. Uh, and we're starting out with the very best from Swedish defense with uh, Major General Mats Helgesen, who's uh, chief uh, of the Swedish uh, Air Force, and I have to say one of the happiest people uh, here uh, because of the big budget increase that was announced uh, last week. And I should only say probably the only other air chief I know who's also a uh, ranger qualified in the United, uh, United States. Sir, talk to us a little bit about the budget increase and what it specifically means for the Swedish Air Force. Uh, ten days ago, our parliament agreed upon how to finance the white book that was issued earlier this year in May. And from my perspective in the Air Force, it means, as one example, that I will keep my current versions of the Charlie Delta Grippens and at the same time introduce the Echoes, the, the new generations. I will keep a larger fleet and more aircraft. That's a good example, and it's a great, great difference for us for our air defense. Um, and uh, just, uh, just to let the audience know, I mean, it's a very sizable defense increase, 45% uh, over the existing plan in the next uh, budget law process, and that's over a 10-year period uh, from a planning perspective. Uh, talk to us about improving readiness. Uh, you were of a generation that uh, was, uh, you know, lived off of that massive investment the Swedish Air Force had. I think a lot of people don't recognize that throughout the Cold War, the Swedish Air Force was both one of the most advanced, but also one of the biggest air forces in the world. Um, the force has shrunk, um, not as much focus on high intensity, anti-access operations, which is the, the kind of thing Sweden always prided itself on. Talk to us about that readiness curve you've been on. You and I talked about your plan several years ago in Linköping when we uh, spoke. Talk to us about where you are on that plan of rebuilding that high-end capability you're seeking. I think we are on a good way. I mean, we have had really good exercises and, and good training for our crews and our entire Air Force. We've done, for instance, uh, the Air Force exercise with our Finnish friends that we have done operations on dispersed basis with deeply integrated uh, air defense assets. So, so we are well into that process and I'm, I'm really happy where we are. But of course we need to train more and we need to have a lot of more training for, for uh, larger units uh, in com combination. Um, where are you on, uh, obviously you're bringing a lot of uh, remote bases, road base operations that uh, you know Sweden always prided, prided itself on, but one of the other things was increasing spare parts stores, for example, increasing weapon stores, new generation of weapons, uh, latest version of the RB-15, for example. Where are you in that process of rebuilding the weapons inventories, getting the logistical and support skills where they need to be? We have a plan for the upcoming five to seven years to fill the stores again, uh, to make sure that we have all, all the repair parts, uh, all the weapons and uh, ammunition that we need. And we will also do it in a, in a way that we more or less did during the Cold War. We will have dispersed storehouses and uh, spread out to be more robust and more resilient. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about electronic uh, warfare. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum was something that Sweden's always prided itself on in, in, in being um, one of the world's most highly capable nations on that. Your presentation here was based on it. And add the anti-access area denial part of it. You know, everybody is talking about A2AD as if it's a new thing, whereas there are some countries that have lived with this for, for quite a long time. Uh, you know, Andreas Krause, uh, the f uh, chief of the German Navy, uh, vice admiral, you know, was a submariner in the, in the 80s. You know, he said the Baltic was an anti-access area mm -hmm. denial area. You know, get over it. It's something we're familiar with. Talk to us about electronic warfare and talk to us about a Swedish perspective on, on how to think about uh, A2AD bubbles. I think um, EW is something that you need to be, uh, in, it's, it's, it's a part of the DNA of, of fighter tactics or air defense tactics or how we use our assets. So EW isn't something special. It's a part of everything. It's like the airframe. It must be there, otherwise you can't do combat. And uh, from my perspective, we operate inside the bubble every day. I mean, we do the training over the Baltic and that is really, really close to those assets. So I'm, for us, it's not, uh, getting into the bubble. It's more or less surviving in the bubble. Um, and uh, how do you um, think about, uh, how would you characterize the behavior of the Russians? Russia has been able to dial it up, dial it back down, uh, has gotten very provocative, both from 
um, an internal Swedish perspective to put disinformation out. Sweden was one of the first countries that was talking about sophisticated Russian disinformation tactics that have now been pioneered and used elsewhere in the world, uh, while at the same time having to deal with some Russian provocations. How would you characterize Russian behavior over the Baltic from an air perspective now? I mean, it's <clears throat> it's not on in the same amount of activities that we saw during the Cold War. It, it is not. But if you go back 10 years, it's a significant increase. So we see a lot more Russian aircraft, fighters, bombers, uh, SIGINT aircraft flying over the Baltic. And once in a while, we see strange behaviors. We see flying without transponders. We see little too close passes and stuff like that. And sometimes it's even unprofessional. So we have seen a change. Uh, but we are now, since the last let's say three years on a pretty stable level. Um, and uh, two other questions. Uh, uh, Sweden is uh, uh, proudly neutral, but still a proud member of the European Union, while at the same time having a very close uh, and growing strategic partnership with the United States. Talk to us about both of those uh, elements and how you're working both with uh, European nations, obviously uh, an increasingly intimate relationship with everybody in the Baltics, with exchange officers, for example, from Finland and, and uh, you know other nations in, in Sweden now, very open channels directly with Norway as well. Uh, increasingly. Walk us through the strategic picture of closer cooperation within Europe, but also closer cooperation with NATO as well as the United States. First of all, since 1995, when we joined the European Union, we are not neutral anymore. So we are uh, non-military aligned. We, we are not part of a military alliance, but we have a lot of, of other alliances. Uh, EU, uh, Nordic cooperation in different areas, a lot of bilateral activities with the United States. So we are not neutral, but we have a lot of different agreements and uh, agreements with different countries and organizations. Um, and uh, speaking about acquisition programs, you were at the Royal International Air Tattoo, as uh, were we, for the big announcement that Sweden was joining the United Kingdom uh, on its new program to develop a future uh, combat uh, air system. Um, obviously, uh, not part of the Tempest program necessarily, which is the demonstrator, but the broader program in terms of thinking about the future. Um, you know, as a nation that is now bringing the E version of the Gripen, right, the Super Gripen, if you will, in, into service at this point, how how are you thinking, what are the capabilities from a Swedish perspective you want out of a next generation platform? Because it's clear that, for example, the Brits are talking about a stealthy platform or a significantly lower observable platform. What, what, are, what is the Swedish air chief at this important time? Are the capabilities you need after Gripen, which is what this airplane is going to be? And that's exactly what we are investigating right now with the British uh, to find uh, areas where we could cooperate and uh, industry could cooperate uh, and our academia could cooperate. So exactly what kind of capabilities we will need in the 50s and 60s, I'm not sure about that. But I will have smart people thinking about it for a long time. And you need a long time to, to make sure you design your air defense in a, in a good way. You know, you, you just mentioned air defense, which takes me to uh, the question that historically Sweden has done air defense with a very, very strong air force being on that on that front edge. But for the first time, Sweden now has a ground-based uh, massive air defense system, which is in the form of the Patriot, which is basically a national defense yeah. system. How are you integrating that into your broader uh, air doctrine, given that it's something that's a little bit of a different model? You've used air defense missiles, but much shorter range systems. Talk to us about a system that does extend that defense bubble quite far from uh, Swedish territory? I mean, uh, I mean, we, we look upon the Patriot missiles as a part of the air defense. We integrate it completely. It's under my command tactically, and we operate with fighters in the same area as we are intending to use the Patriot. So it will be an integrated part uh, as the number five in the four ship. So there is no big intellectual change from your standpoint or CONOPS change in terms of the integration of the system into uh, the Swedish operating model? No, I don't think so. We will have a stronger fist. And uh, uh, in terms of reach, there are a whole series of systems, right, RB-15E, which is the new uh, weapon, to give you a little bit uh, greater sea power reach. From the standpoint of extending the arms of the Swedish Air Force, uh, both defensively but also offensively, which uh, was a doctrine change a few years ago, talk to us about some of the priority programs you have to increase that punch uh, and increase that defensive envelope as well. You know, obviously Meteor is a key part of that as well, but from a to total package standpoint. I mean, our political masters has been very clear to us that they want us to develop a long-range ground strike cap 
capability. So that is something we will do, and it's clearly stated in the White Book uh, issued this May. So we will build up the capacity, some sort of cruise missile, that kind of asset. And conscription is one thing which you've spoken very strongly about, about being a good model. In fact, we were talking uh, to, uh, we're having a very, very good conversation about the role of that. What's the best way to think about conscription and why is it so important from, a, from your standpoint uh, as a Swedish commander? It, it's many different perspectives of conscription. I like it a lot because you get a good, good um, feeling for the defense among the population. And you also get training for a lot of our youngsters in age when they are still uh, being formed. So I think it's very good for us. And we also get the volumes we need for the armed forces. So it's, in many perspectives, it's very good for us. Major General Mats Helgeson, Chief of the Swedish Air Force, sir. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. I know your time was very, very tight here, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, see you up in Sweden. Thank you very much. Always welcome, Sweden.